Ooh, fusion. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I've played over that backing track, but it is a lot of fun. Hi guys, how you doing? Nick Jennison for Guitar Interactive GI+. We're here. It's Monday. We are back on our rightful time and our rightful day of the week. It's the first Monday live stream of the year. Happy New Year if I haven't seen you already. If you're with us uh, on Wednesday, just gone, and if you're wondering why it feels like an awfully short time between live streams, well, we did a stream on Wednesday, but this is the first proper bona fide Monday stream back. It's Monday. We're doing the thing we do on Mondays, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. And today we're talking about how we can make your practice more effective, uh, not necessarily more efficient. That's something we've done before. Uh, we've talked about the efficiency of practice, and efficiency of practice this is important, uh, but we're going to be talking specifically about making your practice effective uh, today. So, a couple of little bits of housekeeping. First of all, I want to take a quick second and shout out today's sponsor. Today, uh, our stream is brought to you by our friends at Hourly Sound, and specifically their fantastic app, Songmaster Pro, that you saw me playing using uh, in the intro. We're playing the backing track in Songmaster Pro. I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. This is a really cool practice tool. Uh, it's also great for um, you know, putting together tracks to play with over live, uh, to play over live rather, if you have a live set that you use backing tracks with, or maybe you want to make stems uh, to play along with as part of a band thing, or you want to do some remix work. There's loads of entertaining stuff to be had here. Uh, it is essentially the best parts of a phrase trainer and a like an AI audio track separator but combined into one product is very very cool uh, we did a review of this in a previous edition of guitar interactive magazine i liked it a lot there's lots of other things that'll do a similar sort of job but you know nothing to my mind that does all of these jobs all in one package which is very cool we'll explore that in a little bit uh as we go forward we'll be using that over the course of today's session um but also i wanted to a little easy for me to say also i want to take a quick second and say hello. So if you are one of our returning uh, regulars on these live streams, hey, it's great to have you back. Uh, lovely to see you. If you're a new viewer, or perhaps a returning relapse streamer who hasn't been with us for a little while but is coming back, it is great to have you back. Once again, this is our regular Monday live stream slot. We do this every Monday, 8 p.m. UK time. Count there, we're gonna be doing one every week this year, uh, going forward from this week. And it's gonna be Mondays, unless some kind of major festivity or huge global catastrophe uh, curtails things and even then the catastrophe I think we'll find a way through. So we're going to take a quick second to say hello to the guys in the comment section. Let's see who's in the house. Marcin is obviously the first one down. Says Marcin, hello guys, uh, says Marcin and he says hope the tube doesn't cut my comment this time. I don't know what happened there last week man. It's really weird. I think it knew it wasn't a Monday and it was like it's a Wednesday. Why is Marcin on YouTube this early? Um, I don't know who knows but listen it's great to have you for anybody who's not in on the uh on the joke Marcin is one of our early birds along with uh pj who's also usually the second one through the door pj it's great to see you uh my comments vanished too last week probably me anyway hello nick and all the gang pj it's great to see you uh who else do we have response audio is in the house says ha guess who uh david coverdale i don't know uh just first name that came to my mind um uh, and i'm not 100 percent sure why for specific I haven't been to red car lately but uh hmm, who knows anyway response audio it is great to see you always in with good insights and good crack uh who else do we have daryl queen is in the house says hi chat hi nick given the title of the stream it looks like we're training in shredding for wood shedding oh i like that trading and shredding for wood shedding well you know yes and no because this stuff does promote some better shred action so don't feel like the shred thing is is done we're coming back to the shred thing but you've got to be able to practice to get better at the shred so kind of but mm, who knows uh i don't think that's an overly americanized term for practice is it i hear scott divine use it at least it's a funny one you know it's one of those terms that's made it across the pond um but has seen widespread widespread uh, adoption and I think the woodshed is a thing uh, certainly out in the wilderness uh, I have a friend who's descended from a, a long line of woodsmen and he assures me that the woodshed has a similar meaning uh, where he comes from so yeah I guess it is uh, response audience says don't know uh, if it's true but a guy once told me the term woodshed 
came from jazz saxophonist Coleman Hawkins, who used to practice and teach in his woodshed on Long Island. I hope that is true. Uh, if it is, then hey, that's very, very cool. Uh, if it's not, I'm going to pretend that it is and use it anyway. Uh, so we got some cool observations coming in already. PJ is saying, uh, what makes practice effective for me is simply to enjoy it. We are going to start that up because that's really, really important. Uh, it's one of the things that is going to ensure uh, a long-term long -term success with your practice, for sure. So we're going to get to that. That's really, really cool. Uh, I like that a lot. Kim is in the house. It's on the phone to Kim just a little bit before the start of this stream. We've got some exciting stuff coming for you guys uh, in the coming weeks and months, but uh, I can't reveal yet. It's stuff that's taken a bit of time, so I'll tell you in the fullness of time. I don't want to overpromise, and I don't want to reveal anything uh, before it's ready, but we have got some really cool stuff coming. Uh, who else do we have? Let's say hello. Foghornish is making a passing visit. It's lovely see you hope you can catch this up uh, a little bit later on if you have to dash but it's good to have you on board um, we got some really cool observations about practice from daryl queen and response audio we're going to talk about that in a bit larry warren is in the house uh, i can't shout out larry's christmas album anymore but if you release a new album we will definitely shout that out on the stream uh, it says hello guys nick an age-old question effective practicing what does that mean this is uh the air is new and getting into a great routine is so important i totally agree now the last couple of years we've kicked off our yeah with some uh evidence-based goal setting uh which i think is really important but those streams we've done so if you want a little bit of stuff on um how to set good evidence-based goals that you're more likely to follow through on then i would encourage you to go and check out the stream uh from january the first week of january 2023 we did a really good one uh that i ended up using with a bunch your students this year as well and they've had a lot of success with it too so yeah cool stuff i would definitely encourage you to check that out but we'll talk about that larry we'll make sure you uh you come away with a good definition by the end of today's stream hi nick hi guys it's sacred god slayer good to have you on board our metal correspondent timothy appling is in the house timothy good to see you uh who else do we have we're going to very quickly say hello to some folks that we might have missed uh david yates is in the house says even nick even guys hope you're all well doing good man good to see you uh steve mcd is in the house says hi guys i spend more time messing around with my quad cortex than actually practicing you know some would argue that getting a tone uh that you really like is kind of like practicing ish but uh what i'm going to say to you uh steve is i'm going to give you the cheat code for the lead tone uh so you've seen these like tone in 30 seconds uh a tone in 60 seconds clips that neural have been doing if you want uh the tone that i tend to use um, it's really, really simple. Um, I use the uh, neural capture of a Victor Mega Squid 7. Victor Mega Squid 7. That's my amp sound. Don't use any pedals with it, uh, any overdrives, any of that sort of stuff. I leave everything at 12. If I'm using a lower gain guitar like this, I might bump the gain up to two plus two plus three something like that but that's the one as far as cabs uh it's anything with greenbacks that's me um but yeah the victor mega squid no surprise is is the victory super kraken which is my favorite app and uh capture seven i don't know specifically what's going on but it sounds and feels quite close to my preferred settings on the super kraken so that's what i use bit of uh, stereo delay a bit of room reverb and a bit from the ambience block as well so there you go cheat codes you want a good lead sound out of quad cortex that's how you get it uh <laughs> value i think who knows d mac is in the house a face we haven't seen in a while it's good to have you back on board uh phil jones is here uh happy new year all okay i'm a bit late hey you know better late than never uh cracker tom is in the house uh cracker tom is good to see you uh think i'm back in germany this year at some point so um yeah who knows it's a big country but you know happy i'm uh happy to get to go there i do love a bit of germany um specifically i think i'm back in Würzburg, which is just a gorgeous city like really really beautiful uh who else do we have helmet strap is in the house it's good to see you phil jones is here says just working through the picking strategy course solo study on gi plus at the moment sounds impressive until you realize i'm having to play it at 70 percent speed there's nothing wrong with that and we're going to get to that in a second right we're going to talk about that because uh what may be a challenging speed for you might be an impossible speed for others and might be something that's maybe not super challenging for other folks so don't worry about that playing things at uh, a reduced tempo 
it's about finding your your pace with this and we'll talk about that in this session so it's part of what makes the the practice thing effective if that makes sense mike seedorf is here uh keith mof is here who else do we have dmax is nice room thanks man appreciate it i'm surrounded by loads of amps and guitars it's a good place to be it's my little happy spot uh tony stramalaban is here tony is good to have you back it's been a little minute uh <laughs> dead man doogie van dugerson says is it really monday who stole saturday and sunday for sure man i worked saturday and sunday working the new album for this year and uh, oh no never mind chris davis is here uh and i I think that's all of the hellos I have to say. So very very quickly, before we get stuck into the meat of today's session, I want to take another quick second and shout out our sponsor. It is, of course, Already Sound, uh, Songmaster Pro. I want to show you what this thing can do. So the backing track you heard me playing in the intro was one of our GI Plus backing tracks, but we're going to use this uh, across the stream today. What it basically allows me to do is load in a, an audio file and it splits it out into streams. It detects the chords. You can probably see those along the top. So for example, highlight there, C major seven, C minor seven, D minor seven, F minor seven. It has detected all of the chords, uh, including this funny little beast down here with Steve's little pickup fill. Steve is the guy who played bass on this, but it also gives us stems for drums. I'm just gonna play these. As a drum stem. If we don't want to hear drums, we can just take a listen to my man Steve's fantastic, fantastic bass parts. We can throw in this The Rest stream, which is some pads that I had put on. We can turn them all on. Just turn the bass off if that's getting in the way. It's a nice busy bass line, but we can turn that off, etc. Another little bit of stuff coming up here, which is a little bit of a pad shimmer, but what I can also do with this is, and go in here in tools, if that's a little quick for me, I can slow this down. I can also loop sections. So let's say, for example, I want to take just this little part of the track here. Let's just grab it real quick. Oh, I can pick them up moving as well. But let's say I want to take uh, maybe a very small board from the track, maybe just this bit. Let's find it. I can loop that. I can determine how big the loop's going to be. So let's say I want it, only want to play over one, over one chord change. You can see that. C minus seven. say that's a little bit too fast. So let's pull it down a bit slower. Fun. You can do all sorts of stuff with this, right? It's a very, very cool app. We're going to be using this as we go forward to play some of our backing tracks. So, yeah, once again, thanks to Hourly Sound for sponsoring today's stream. But let's get into it. So, first of all, when it comes to effective practice, right, effective practice, we need to do a little bit of definition of terms before we go any further. So, in terms of practice effectiveness, uh, what do we actually mean by practice being effective? I'd like to know what you think about this in the comments. So drop me a comment down below. Let me know what you think makes effective practice. But I have a few suggestions myself. Uh, so for example, um, I, uh, <laughs> Nick Harrison saying within seconds of me joining, he hits the sleaze button. I think he's referring to the, uh, the lovely sludgy funk that we like. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. There's something about that real slow, sultry kind of thing. It's very, very cool. Uh, so effective practice for me, um, is practice that moves us closer towards our goals as players. So if we took the, uh, the, the counter to this, which might be ineffective practice, ineffective practice is practice where we put a lot of time into something and don't really see any results. We don't see any progress in our playing, as Keith MOF has rightly uh, pointed out here. Uh, progress, uh, totally agree. Yeah, if we, 
If we do a lot of stuff and we don't really see any progress, then we can categorize that as ineffective practice. Whereas if we sink some time into practicing and we start to see great gains in our playing, great improvements, then we can consider that to be effective practice. So it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but it's definitely worth having that conversation because, you know, we need to, to determine what we're talking about here. So effective practice is practice that gets us results, which then begs the question, what are results? You know, what do we what do we want from our practice? And this is kind of more of an individual thing, but if we were to bust it down to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got some great comments here. Uh, Insanity's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Albert Einstein. Einstein was S-H-I-T at speed picking. Is it more than three minutes in the stream? He's shit at speed picking, apparently. Jonathan Graham, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? But he was a violinist, so he was probably pretty hot with the left hand. You know, who knows? Um, I don't know if he was any good. I gather he was probably pretty hot because Einstein, but who knows? Anyway, going back to this results business. So what we're trying to achieve when we practice, if we're trying to elicit adaptations, I'll say that again. We're trying to elicit adaptations. The reason for this is you are, as the player, the thing in this musical kind of uh, endeavor that we're doing that is capable of adapting and growing and changing. Your guitar will never grow extra frets. Uh, it will never develop an extra pickup unless you drill a hole and put the extra pickup in. Uh, you can change the setup on your guitar, but ultimately, unless you input something into the guitar, the guitar is going to remain static. It is not, it, it, I'm not going to say it's inert, but it's not uh, it, it's not a, a, an adaptable organism in the way that you are. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to move the thing that will move, which is you. And we're trying to cause adaptations in you both physiologically, in terms of uh, your ability to move your fingers and hands in a way that produces the sounds that you want. We're also trying to provoke adaptations in terms of greater knowledge, uh, quicker recall, of things, uh, being able to identify notes on the fretboard quicker. We're also trying to improve your vocabulary uh, in terms of your number of phrases you have available, how ready you can access them, how you can manipulate them in real time, how you can change stuff. But also, if you're learning songs, we're trying to get you not just to have a, a huge repertoire of songs if that's something you're interested in but also to be good at the act of learning songs and our practice should be geared towards these adaptations it should be geared towards provoking these adaptations so let's talk about how we get those adaptations and we're going to begin with the most easy one which is the physical the physiological adaptations because these are quite easy to categorize so this can be broadly broken down into, um, I guess, kind of two categories. It can be uh, like kind of physical stuff and you could call it skill, which you might think of as neurological stuff, but ultimately it's the same deal. What we're talking about here is the act of playing things and the act of getting your fingers to move in a way that you want them to move, uh, if that makes sense. So let's do some stuff. And for this, what we tend to do is we tend to uh, do this using exercises. If you're not familiar with the idea of playing exercises on the guitar, uh, it's something that was very much in fashion uh, during the guitar arms race of the 80s and 90s and then kind of seemed to fall out of fashion uh, since then, but you know, fashions change, but ultimately the exercise is a useful thing. And you can turn pretty much anything into the ex into an exercise. You can take any piece of music, any scale, and you can make an exercise from it. But ultimately, what makes a good exercise is that uh, the exercise is specific to the thing that we're trying to improve. So let's pick something. Let's say we're trying to improve our finger independence. That seems to be a very common question for guitar players. So what we might do is I'm going to throw Song Master Pro on again. Uh, we'll go back up to full speed for this, but we're going to play something in the key of C. So we'll be playing C minor. Let's go to the two hands close up. Uh, or we'll go to this close up rather, and I'll show you what's going on here. So what we might do is we might look for something where we can play something within our C scale and get some kind of finger independence challenge out of it. So if we take C minor pentatonic as our basis, 
like this guy. And we assume that we're playing C minor 7, so we can assume it's C Dorian. Don't need to worry too much about exactly what's going on there. What we might do is we might play the following. We might take our C and put it here. And then we might play finger 1 on the raised 6. Finger 2 on the flat 7. Finger 3 on the raised 7. Finger 4 on the root. That makes sense, and we can do this in context with our backing track from Songmaster Pro that we'll throw on. I'll just turn it down a little bit because the song is maybe a little bit hot here. What we're trying to do here, so I've looped up this section of track that is just on C minor seven. I'm going to turn the bass off because the bass is a little bit confusing for what we're trying to do here. I feel like the chord swell is probably enough. Should also point out, by the way, should also point out that. I didn't have to load these individual instruments into Soundmaster Pro. I just dropped the audio file in and it pulled them out for me, which is pretty cool. So, what I might do is I might take this exercise, I'm going to turn the delay off because the delay is probably a little bit annoying for this. We might play fingers one, two, three, and four. And we might play like this. Now this at its most basic is a classic finger independence exercise. And we can improve on this, we can make it better. I'm just gonna turn my monitors down a little bit so it's not bleeding too much into my microphone. Let's just go here, there we go. Um, yeah, I don't wanna to spill too much into my dialogue mic, but what this will give us an opportunity to do is to explore the question of that's cool, but how fast should I do it? Well, here's the deal, right? What I wanna do is I wanna take this idea of playing this one, two, three, four on fret seven, eight, nine, and 10. And I wanna see, I wanna see how fast we can get it before it starts to be challenging. Because here's the thing, right? If you play like this, slow our track down. And I play. dreadfully challenging speed. I could probably do this for the rest of my life. I can talk over the top. It's not posing any real difficulty. If, however, I was to increase the speed to here, this is 120, I might get this. That's still not terribly challenging. What if I increase the speed again? What if I go to... That's a bit too far. Let's maybe go up to 135. I might go here. Yep, pretty easy. Let's go a little further. Let's go up to 160. I hope you're trying along with home here, by the way, because this is going to be important. Let's go up to 180. That's still pretty comfy. Uh, let's maybe try something crazy. Let's try 200, 206. That's starting to come apart a little bit. Maybe it's just I can't hear it terribly accurately. So let's go down to 103 and try. Well, that's pretty fast, pretty quick. Now, what this should have highlighted for you is that there is a threshold where this starts to become a little bit challenging, but there's also a point shortly after that threshold where it starts to become damn near impossible. Now, this is where I'm going to draw on my uh, gym rat background, if that makes sense, right? So you guys know if you're a, a long time uh, viewer of the stream, you know that I'm a bit of a meathead. Um, so I, I do like to lift weights. now. 
Generally speaking, there is a little sweet spot in terms of load selection when it comes to training with weights. And this is pertinent to playing the guitar, right? This is going to uh, reflect on the way we're going to practice. So when you train, let's say, for example, you were going to do a, let's say you were going to do a leg press, for argument's sake, or a barbell squat. It doesn't matter, but we'll use the leg press, for example, right? I've been leg press in absolutely ages because I'm powerlifter and we don't do that sort of thing but still um that's a joke uh but let's say for example we use well let's use a barbell squat actually it's probably a better example so a barbell squat uh there is going to be a weight that you could load on that bar no matter what your current strength level is that is not going to provide pretty much any challenge at all if that makes sense so um if say for example we gave you a bar that was made out of pvc Right, it was PVC pipe, and it didn't weigh anything. And we attached this can of Fanta Zero that is empty to either side and said, squat down, stand back up. You're probably gonna be okay. You're probably gonna be fine because it's not a whole lot of weight. It weighs less than you're shopping. If, by contrast, we gave you a 20 kilo bar and then we attached a Harley Davidson to either side, unless you're competing in this year's World's Strongest Man, that's probably going nowhere apart from down. So we'll put it on your back and you'll get crushed. So somewhere in between these two extremes is going to be a little sweet spot. And this is where we want to do most of our training. And the same is true for our practice. So what we might look for is we might look for a load that somewhere within our desired rep range, let's say we wanted to do five repetitions. Uh, there's going to be a load for you where those five repetitions are challenging but not impossible. They slow down, you have to uh, strain a little bit, but ultimately you come out the other end and you go, yeah, that was okay. I feel like I maybe could have done one or two more if, you know, or maybe that was all I had, but I managed it. That is a productive place to train. And that's what we might refer to with our guitar playing, certainly with speed and with uh, intensity in our practice as the challenge zone. And this is going to be different for different exercises. You won't have one speed that is going to be the challenge zone for every exercise. In the same way, you won't have one weight that is the same weight that you use for every lifting exercise. You're not going to do uh, bicep curls with the same weight that you would do deadlifts with, for example, because unless you've got a really weak deadlift or a really, really strong barbell curl. Who knows? Anyway, so what we might do is we might take this exercise and we might look for a speed where this is going to become challenging for us. So we're going to do this with the app and I'll speed it up and we'll see where you get to. So we'll do a couple of tempo landmarks and we'll see how quickly we can get to this challenge pace for you. So same exercise, once again, the exercise is going to be, uh, oh, uh, two of me, there you go, trapped in the phantom zone. We're going to play seven, eight, nine, ten. That's it. And we're going to loop it round and round and round like this. We're going to begin by playing 16th notes at 100 BPM. And if this is already challenging, let me know. This is our speed. And I'm picking this. Picking every note. But you can play this any way you want. It doesn't really matter. Let me know if that feels okay because we're going up. That's 103 BPM. You can see it on the metronome over here. Our metronome mark. But if we speed the track up, let's go up to 120.2 BPM. Same exercise. Let's try it. One, two, three, four. Should still feel pretty comfy. But maybe it doesn't. Maybe it feels challenging. If 120 is the tempo that you feel challenged by, let me know in the comments. Let's speed it up. Let's go 135.8. We won't sweat the point eight. If you're not even going to notice that. That's an imperceptible difference. Okay, let's try that. Ready? One, two, three, four. There's a speed. Feeling okay? Fingers crossed. Let's move it up to 
five. Getting into the speeds we might call fast now, so let's try that. One, two, three, four. Anyone still with me? Anyone still with me? If you're still with me, let me know. We're not going too much faster. We're going to go a little bit further. We're going to go up to 161. Fast. Let's try it together. Ready? A one, two, three, four. Still feeling good? We're going to leave that there. Now, I want to know from you, I want to know from you guys, which tempo did you find that challenge spot to be, right? Where did you find that challenge spot for this exercise? Because here's the thing, you'll find that this is challenging somewhere in the region of, ah, here's an interesting one, right? Helmer Strap says, uh, out at 135, little finger couldn't keep up. That's okay, that's cool. For Keith MOF says, that's too fast. Uh, 135 for um, Tony Stramalaband. Uh, Four Cornish dropped out at some point. Saint Regard Slayer, fingers of the gods uh, is, uh, <laughs> He's going, Marcin's the same. Says, I thought we were just getting started. Uh, we got some shredders in the house, and that's okay. The point with this is that there is no one speed. There's no one speed that is going to be challenging for everybody on any of these things. It's individual, and it depends on a whole variety of factors, not least of which is how much you've practiced playing fast, genuinely. Uh, some genetic components, but not as much as you'd think. Um... I would definitely say that practice outweighs genetics um, when it comes to getting results for this, but there is definitely a genetic component to how fast you can twitch your fingers. Some people have these really twitchy, uh, fast twitch fingers going on. I feel like I'm one of them. I feel like I've got a bit of the old twitchy fingers going on, but ultimately that's not going to hinder you from playing as fast as you're ever going to want to play even if you don't have that going on. Uh, I have a friend who definitely doesn't, and he can absolutely cook. Um, so don't let that put you off. Uh, other things that can affect this include the exercise itself, the guitar you're playing on, um, how comfortable that guitar is. Uh, it can also be determined by various factors that change from day to day. So this might be things like your mood, your sleep status, your nutritional status, how much you practiced uh, the day before, how much you've practiced in the weeks running up to today's session, whether you're tired and fatigued, if that makes sense. Uh, Racco Ivan says, it'd be great to see your right hand. Don't worry, we can definitely do that. Uh, I got a right hand camera for you, right here if you want one. Hey, right hand camera. <laughs> We'll do more of that in a bit, but I thought it'd be more important to see the app than to see my right hand, but I will definitely make sure we can see that in the future. It's a very good comment. You're absolutely correct. So, um, now, going a little further with this. Well, oh, we were talking about the daily factors. Yeah, so the point with this is your daily performance can fluctuate. So, I would expect somewhere in the region of a 5 to maybe even 10% swing in terms of where the challenge tempo is. So if your challenge speed, let's say, is 130 BPM, you might find that the place where you're challenged might vary by as much as 12 or 13 BPM on a given day. Doesn't actually matter what the target tempo is. What matters is that you're in that spot where it's challenging but not impossible challenging but not impossible. Let me show you what that might look like, not by using more speed, but by using a more difficult exercise. So for this, what we're going to do is we're going to change up our exercise to challenge more of our fingers. So let's get into that. So we're not just going to do finger exercises today, by the way. We're going to do a bunch of stuff uh, on musical stuff too, but this is just to show you the concept of this challenge idea. So let's talk a little bit about uh let's talk uh, a little bit about how we might make this a little bit more difficult so for me something i've noticed is that i tend to have some difficulty with uh passages where my third finger is on a different string to my other fingers so let's say instead of playing this <laughs> Let's say I wanted to move everything up one string apart from my third finger. That's still very challenging, right? So what I'm playing here is I'm playing seven and eight 
on my G string, nine to give me melodic minor on my D string, and then 10 back on the G string. You can hear that. That little overlap there, which is quite annoying. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what happens when I get to this challenge spot in my own plane. We're not gonna go as far as 160. Let's start with 120, and hopefully I can play it there. Well, wouldn't you know that? That's challenging already. It's quite hard. Let's go again. Uh, yeah. That's probably even a little too hard. Let's maybe slow it down a little bit. Let's maybe try it at around 110. Let's go here. Yep. Yeah. Now what you should see here with this is you should see, we're not worried about the fingers or the, the picking particularly, but what you should be seeing is you should be seeing a degree of concentration that I'm having to maintain to make this work. So if I focus and I really, really concentrate, I can make this happen. Uh, but it's not easy. It's in a nice little spot where things are difficult but not impossible. And I'm able to do this by manipulating the tempo because with these technical things, tempo is usually how we change the uh, the difficulty of stuff. In the same way, going back to uh, our analogy of lifting weights in the gym, it's normally the amount of weight on the bar that we use to manipulate how difficult something is. There are other things you can use to manipulate it. You can use things like number of repetitions, rest times, exercise tempo, etc., etc., etc. But yeah, not the easiest exercise in the world. But that's to demonstrate what that might look like at it, a speed that would be good for me to present the challenge to myself at. So if I practice there for a while, I could expect to see some results. Now the reason for this is because this is at a point where I'm having, I'm having to concentrate to do this. I'm having to provoke some skill adaptations here. This is not something I can do in my sleep. I'm challenging myself. And by challenging myself, by doing this challenging exercise at a challenging speed, I am forcing myself uh, to adapt to the demands of the challenge. Now, this leads us to a very important principle from exercise science, which is the SAID principle, the S-A-I-D, and that stands for Specificity of Adaptation to Imposed Demand. I'll say it again. Specificity of Adaptation to Imposed Demand. What this means is that when we practice our guitar, the skills we develop are specific to the skills that we practice. So, for example, uh, if we practice something like this, where our focus is on independence between the third and fourth fingers on different strings, that's what we're gonna get from this. We're gonna get good at doing that. I'm not gonna be getting good at doing six string sweet picking, if that makes sense. So, sweet picking, not from this. I'll get some general adaptation, but my sweep picking probably won't improve from this exercise unless it's a very specific portion of some sweep picking where this finger combination becomes a challenge. So what we then start to do is we start to construct exercises that uh, challenge the things we want to challenge, which is our next principle, but we're gonna get to that in a second. So once again, I'll just show you some more examples of when this is gonna be appropriate, when it's not gonna be appropriate. Let's go back to our app, and let's just go to this camera real quick. We'll get rid of the little uh, mini me, because we can't really see me in that corner if I do this. Uh, let's do a bit of this. So we worked out this was an appropriate speed, where I go. That's a good speed. If I was to play it at this sort of speed. That's fine for warming up and getting my fingers generally adapted to what I'm trying to do. That's probably not gonna provide too much of a challenge for me because I can do that quite easily. 
So what I would do instead is I would find that challenge spot and I would spend my practice time here where I'm going. Whereas if I played it too fast, you saw I defaulted to 120, tried that in our first attempt. That's different. You can see that only that 20, only that, I'm sorry, that 10 BPM jump has made it go from challenging to a bit too hard. And I'll go like this, maybe. I'll go. Starting to get a bit easier, maybe. I'm just getting good at it. But let's try one, four, five, and go. Definitely too hard. I'm going to fall off on that in a minute. That's the point where it becomes a little less productive because it's a little bit too difficult at that point. So that's the difficulty thing. Our next question is, that's cool, but what should we be working on? What exercises should we choose for our playing? And this refers to the principle of specificity that we just talked about. I want to take a second, though, and say hello to me. Hi, me. How are you doing? Me, of course you can ask for advice. That is what we are here for. Please do. Uh, got some advice? Here's an interesting question. We'll address this in the Q&A section a little bit later on, but I'm going to turn this over to the comment section uh, because we've got some really great members here who might be able to answer this question for you. So uh, it says, do you think it's better to learn slash play basics on acoustic guitar and then later move on to electric? Now, I have some opinions on this and me, we're going to come back to this in a little bit when we do our Q&A session, but uh, I want to ask the comment section to give you some advice on this. So, dear comment section, got some advice for me. Again, the question is, do you think it's better to learn and play the basics on acoustic guitar and later move to electrics? Uh, give me some help, right? What, tell, tell them what you think. Um, and I'm intrigued to know what you guys think about this. So, on to exercise selection. How we choose the things that we're going to practice. Well, first of all, uh, there are a few considerations with our exercises that we select. The first thing that we must consider, must consider, the first thing we've got to consider is, is this exercise going to improve the qualities that I want in my playing? And the best way to tell if that's going to be the case is, does it directly address weaknesses in the things that you're trying to improve? So, I keep going back to fitness for this, but let's say, for example, you had a New Year's resolution uh, that you wanted to run a half marathon. You want to run a half marathon. Probably, probably not the best use of your time for that specific goal in the gym, let's say, would be to go in and do uh, one repetition maximum efforts on the barbell bench press. So trying to improve your bench press numbers. I'm just going to bench press loads of heavy weights. And if somebody comes up to you and goes like, hey, why are you doing that? You're going to compete in powerlifting? And they'll be like, you'd be like, no, I'm going to run a half marathon. And they would probably rightly look at you and go, why are you bench pressing then? Shouldn't you be running? And yeah, obviously you should be doing some stuff, running, cycling, trying to get your cardio up, trying to get your, uh, your uh, body weight down, all that sort of stuff, if that makes sense. So yeah, um, there is a comment. Uh, yes, yes, I am. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so the point with this anyway is specificity. Your exercises should be specific to your goals. Now, the exercise we just chose there was one that was specific to my challenge of this one weird situation where my third finger just doesn't like to play ball. So I found a little exercise there that worked for me. I did it along with music and I tried to find uh, a context within a scale that allowed me to do that. And that's cool right? Important stuff. So what you might do if you have different goals, let's say, for example, your goal was to uh, improve your phrasing, to improve your phrasing. Well, that's a very big goal. We might need to drill a bit deeper into that, but we might use exercises that aren't a prescribed set of notes per se to develop your phrasing, but we might use a prescribed set of challenges or limitations. So if I said to you, uh, time to improve your phrasing, we'll just play the guitar with better phrasing. Yeah, duh, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, that'd be a little like if somebody said, I'm trying to improve my 100 meters time. And I said, well, what you need to do is run the 100 meters faster. They go, yeah, thanks doc. 
that's exactly what I know. I know it's what I'm trying to do here. But obviously, that's silly. Uh, so what we might do is we might first start by defining what we mean by good phrasing. And good phrasing might be phrasing. Good phrasing. Don't know what accent that was. Certainly wasn't Geordie. Um, good phrasing might be something along the lines of. Uh, let's say playing something that has a narrative flow to it that sets up tension and resolution um and has a a, a kind of a, a, a i guess you might say a good rhythmic flow um you know things that are pleasing to the ear and things that create this kind of like like journey that we've talked about this narrative thing so what we might do is we might set ourselves the challenge of playing phrases that are a, a setup and a resolution. Set up resolution. So this might be our thing, right? And what we might do is we might begin by just experimenting with that. So let's throw on uh, some new shoes run faster than Mark McNish. New guitar play better. For sure, it worked for Kipchoge, right? Those um, those vapor flies, they were crazy. Um, so maybe you need a, a new guitar. Maybe you need a Maybach. Um, who knows? Uh, it's Maybach came in conversation. I do like the Maybach. It's, it's just pretty and it sounds good. Uh, and it's cool and makes me want to play. So anyway, now, let's go back to our track. So here I'm playing again in C minor, right? The C minor's getting a little bit tired on me, so what I might do is I might just quickly shift the loop to a very important section. I might go to the A minor uh, over here, but with that lovely little bit of, can I set the loop here? Uh, that's not the loop. Oh yeah, that's the loop. Cool. I might set the loop up here, but I might set it up with this little bit of a uh, little bit of tiny wee bit of tiny bit of E dominant seven over the end. So it might go. That's nice. Just give me something to play, right? So what I might do is I may take something like this. That's a phrase that was set up. And then a resolution. Set up. Resolution. Set up. Resolution. So on and so forth. Now, by experimenting with those parameters, I can get myself an exercise that's going to challenge my ability to phrase, if that makes sense. So I can use phrasing in the same context. Now, you can also scale this up and down to make it challenging for yourself. It should be something that is, uh, that's difficult, but not impossible. Now, what you might do with this is if something is too difficult, you might constrain yourself to smaller areas of the fretboard. Or you might try a track that gives you um, Ah, it's a fun one from Daryl Queen. So there's a nice little outside dip there. I would call that good phrasing. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, can you make Locrian sounds possible on that track? Hmm, might be difficult, might be difficult. I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, I could try. Uh, it probably wouldn't sound that great, but I could probably do Locrian Natural 2. Melodic minor Locrian, uh, that might work. Just because we're doing challenges, why not? So this might be a challenge of mine, to master the lock room. And what I might wind up with is something, let's get the track back on so you guys can see what's going on. In fact, let's do two hands cam, because we've not done two hands cam in ages. but it's probably not that great um, you know just because you can doesn't mean you should
Uh, that's what I'm going to say. But it's a good question. It's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. So another example of this might be if you were trying to uh, develop your fretboard knowledge. So fretboard knowledge is one of these things that people... I'm not going to say people struggle with, but, you know, people uh, will often ask the question, how do I improve my fretboard knowledge? How do I make my fretboard knowledge better? Well, um, what you might do is you might set yourself the goal of exploring different parts of the fretboard, looking for certain notes, looking for certain scales, certain sounds, and making connections, uh, but with the limitation of avoiding things that you play most of the time. So fun ways to do this are to eliminate certain notes. So say, for example, I was trying to learn the A Dorian scale a little better up and down my fretboard. I might eliminate the possibility of playing A's. I might go, yep, no A's for me. I'll acknowledge where they are. This is interesting because I have to acknowledge the root. I have to know where they are to not play them. But everything else is fair game. And I'm also going to avoid playing anywhere around the A blues box. So this, this business of eight through to five, that is off limits for me. None of that. So what I could do here is I can set my track away and I can be playing something like this. Well, there's a five, I play seven, that's wrong. We don't want that. That's off limits. Let's bring Steve's bass back in. This is starting to sound a bit too much like Lydian. So. type of exercise we might use to develop our, our fretboard knowledge but the point with this is not to give you specific exercises but just to show you what you're looking at um what you're looking at uh in terms of how to make exercise effective for you and it's these two principles if that makes sense there are other things you might consider but the two principles are the following uh and these are things you should bear in mind when you're choosing designing or uh otherwise selecting exercises First is specificity. Is the exercise specific to your goals? You're not going to get better at learning the A Dorian scale uh, by playing Wonderwall. You're not going to get better at playing Wonderwall by learning the A Dorian scale. Um, you know, uh, is it specific to your goals? That's what we're trying to say. You're not going to get. You're not going to become a better jazz player uh, by learning more. Uh, you know, by, by working on your Malmsteen chops, let's say. You won't become a better Malmsteen by working on your jazz phrasing. has to be specific to your goals. So this requires us to engage with our goals and go, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? So specificity is important, right? Secondly, the second important part of this is what we talked about before, which is the challenge. It has to be challenging, but not impossible. And the way you do this is by manipulating things like tempo, the difficulty of the exercise in terms of the notes that you might play, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, all these sort of things that we talked about earlier on in the stream. If you missed this, you can go and catch it on the replay rather than me trying to summarize them all for you right now. Again, this is gonna be available. Um, oh, come off daryl queen you are banned uh, you're not this is a great point we love it uh will you get better at playing wonderwall by practicing wonderwall i said maybe oh, i set myself up for that um anyway point with this is specificity towards your goals challenge these are the things that are going to make an exercise good and these are the things that are going to make an exercise have uh, a productive effect on your playing and ultimately will make your practice effective. You'll notice that we haven't talked about efficiency. Uh, we haven't talked about any of that stuff. We've done previous streams on that before. This is purely about making a practice time effective. So it's a big high level concept thing, uh, but um, hopefully you'll be able to see how you can apply this in your own playing. So it's time for the question and answer. So let's do it. We're going to do some question and answers. Uh, if you have questions, drop them in the comments down below. This calls for the change in logo. Hey, there you go. Look at that. Your question's answered. Mondays, 8 p.m. UK time. We're all professionals here. So, 
got some cool observations, got some cool questions, but the first thing that I want to do is I want to see what you guys have had to say to our new friend, me, who said, uh, do you think it's better to learn slash play the basics on acoustic guitar and later move to electric? Now, I haven't read your comments yet. I haven't read your comments yet because they've just been coming in while I've been uh, doing that last little bit there. But I knew that would be some good stuff because we have some really great players and really uh, we have some really great thought processes going on in this stream. It's one of the things I love about doing these is you guys really are, um, you always contribute something great to, to this stuff. So really, really into this. I'm looking forward to seeing what you've got to say. Uh, and Rusty was the first answer with what I think is a really great answer, which says, no, play what you want. Uh, if that is only one or the other or both, do it. Rusty, you've hit the, the rusty nail on the head. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with this. I don't think there is necessarily a must do. There are benefits to each, uh, I would say, but those benefits will be outweighed by how much you enjoy playing one or another, especially in the early stages. I think in the early stages, the most important thing is that you enjoy your playing experience. You enjoy the sound that your guitar makes. You enjoy the feel of your guitar. Don't feel like you have to, uh, me, go through some kind of like uh, acoustic purgatory if you don't want to. But if that's what you want to do, don't feel like you have to do anything else. If you want to practice on acoustic, then rock on. Uh, anyway, here's another one though. Um, Marcin says, I started on a cheap acoustic. It definitely saved me from becoming a bass player. <laughs> it's quite funny. I like that. Uh, Mal Riley says, yes, to learn basic chords, some songs to play and get a grip on uh, music knowledge, then move to electric later. Now, this is one of those things that's kind of interesting is, I guess one of the benefits of the acoustic guitar in particular is that it's a there's a much lower barrier to entry in terms of how much stuff you need and how much stuff you need to set up. If you need to pick up and play something uh, and you just want to play some chords, play some songs, you want to sing maybe and accompany yourself, then an acoustic guitar is a great choice because it's really easy to pick it up. You don't need, you need a pick. You might not even need a pick. You can play with your fingers. Uh, you don't need any extra stuff. You don't need an amp. You don't need a cable. You don't need effects pedals. You don't need to put on headphones so the neighbors don't kill you, any of that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely some benefits for sure. Uh, Phil Jones says, not an ex uh, expert by any means, but I've never had an acoustic. I think if you want to play electric, start there. I will agree, totally agree. But say it regards layer in with the nuance, says the main divide is how either guitar is set up. An electric with a bad setup can be harder to play than an acoustic, for sure. So, thing with this is, um, as far as setup goes, if you're new to this, uh, me, setup refers to how comfortable and how easy the guitar is to play. We don't need to get into the minutiae of this, but it's all to do with string tension, string height, and how nicely finished the working parts of the guitar are. So, if the guitar has a very stiff setup, i.e. the strings are a long way away from the frets and they're very, very tight feeling strings, you might find it quite challenging to play just from a purely strength perspective. And that's going to be limiting uh, no matter, you know, how big or strong you are. Uh, for example, um, we're going to Nam later this year, uh, later this month even, we, um, there will be plenty of guitars that I will be unable to get uh, a note out of, and I do not lack strength in the hands, let me tell you that. Uh, I've been playing guitar for, geez, how old am I? Uh, a terrifying amount of time, like 27, 28 years I've been playing the guitar. Um, competitive powerlifter, I've worked up to a 600 pound deadlift, it's not elite by any stretch, but it definitely means my hands are pretty strong, uh, for a guitar player, for sure. There will be lots of guitars that I will struggle to play, because the setup will be bad, um, and this is the reality of playing lots of different guitars. This can be true in an electric, it can be true in an acoustic, unfortunately, at the entry level, you tend to find acoustics, there are more bad setup acoustics than there are bad setup electrics, that's what I'll say. So, um, whatever you decide on, Get it set up. Get a nice setup. Uh, here we go. Um, the one from Mal Riley, which is interesting, though. He says, you can hear all your mistakes on electric, which could be discouraging. And that is interesting. That is definitely interesting. You can uh, hide certain things on electric that you can't hide on an acoustic. But the opposite is definitely true. I agree. There are noises and creaks and the kind of like weird string handling things that you uh you hear on electric that you don't hear on other stuff uh who else do we have uh some other great comments here four cornish says play on electric if you want to play on electric uh if you don't like an acoustic guitar 
but play, you'll likely lose interest. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree with that. Um, so another one, contrasting opinion from Nick Harrison. Uh, Nick Harrison says, my entire guitar technique is based on classical playing. Did it for years before I played acoustic, then electric. Now that is interesting, but I bet that was rooted in being drawn to the classical guitar and really enjoying the process. Whereas if you feel like you're doing it because you feel like you have to, maybe not so much. But, you know, uh, I'm gonna leave this with Dmax comment, which says electric slash acoustic, play what inspires you. I'm inclined to agree with this. And this segues neatly into another important point here, which is another thing that we haven't talked about, which is from PJ, the big observation of the day, which is what makes effective practice for me is to simply enjoy it. Now, this is, the big overarching principle with effective practice. Uh, we've talked about the right difficulty, we've talked about specificity uh, to the adaptations we're trying to provoke. What we haven't talked about is the important bit, the really important bit, the only important bit, which is actually doing it, actually doing the practice. So the least effective practice that you'll ever do is the practice that you don't do. You can have the most perfect routine, uh, all laid out, constructed by uh, science and AI to be the perfect um, practice routine for your needs, but if you don't do it, then it's no good. And ultimately what makes us do the practice is enjoyment. And this is also true for, you know, getting in the gym. Some of us are going to be getting in the gym for the first time in a while because it's New Year. And I will say for you guys that are doing that for the first time as somebody who lives in the gym, uh, or maybe you come about of a layoff, we're happy to see you, right? Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. We're happy that you're there. You belong there. So, um, but the point with this is, you know, we'll get asked this question quite a lot, or I'll see this question asked quite a lot. It's like, especially in powerlifting circles, it'll be like, uh, should I do like uh, squats or leg press to grow my legs? And should I do bench press or dumbbell bench to grow my chest or whatever? Should I run on, should I run on the treadmill or go on the stationary bike? There are benefits to each, but ultimately the most important thing is that you choose the ones that are enjoyable and sustainable, i.e. you choose the exercise modalities and the styles of training that you enjoy the most and that you'll actually do and that you'll actually do for a long period of time. This will get you better results than the most perfect thing that you're not going to do because you actually have to do the thing. So really important when you're putting practice together, as PJ has rightly pointed out, to make your practice enjoyable. I will totally agree with you on that. So here's another great uh, observation from Response Audio. It says, you need to be critical of yourself, extremely critical, but I often put myself down too much at one point. I think there's a, a, an important difference here between being um, constructively critical of yourself and just beating yourself up. So uh, a great book, uh, on the subject, if you want to learn more, which is far beyond the purview of this uh, this stream, is a book called The Inner Game of Tennis uh, by W. Timothy Galway, uh, which I've talked about loads on these streams, but it's the science of, uh, or the psychology rather, of sports performance. And a lot of it involves um, the style of self-talk that we do. We can be honest and make honest critical assessments about our playing, without then inferring value judgments about that, without saying, you know, I can't move my third finger uh, independently the same way I can move my first, second, and fourth fingers. Therefore, I'm a terrible guitarist and a bad person, and nobody wants to listen to me or hang out with me, and I should just go and live in a cave somewhere. Right, that logical leap, that's the bit where we go, or illogical leap, that's the bit where we cut it off. You can make honest assessments about your playing, but what you should not do is descend into self-abuse, which is, uh, you know, saying things like, come on, why can't you do this? You're an idiot. Why can't you do this? Come on, stupid hands. Uh, if only you practice more, you'd be able to do this. Don't do that. That's not productive. Uh, you can make honest observations and go, okay, I need to work on this weakness. Let's get after it and celebrate getting after it and go, let's improve this. This is going to be great. Once I crack this, yes, it's going to be hard. I'm reveling in the fact that this is difficult because this is going to make me better in the long run. And, and the whole thing should be a joyful process, even though you're being critical of yourself, if that makes sense. Very, very uh, philosophical point, if that, uh, 
you know, we tend to go down that way. But uh, here's a good one, and we're going to leave it on this... Um, I'll leave on this. Deadman Doogie Van Dugerson says, here's a good practice tip. Smash the like button on live streams like this one so we get more in the future. Yeah, do that. Definitely do that. He is not a paid actor, I promise. Uh, a cool one from a friend of Alan Entwistle Pickups. Uh, I promise I'll fit that thing soon. Um, says, they've adapted the book into the inner game of music. Indeed they have. Um, I'll be honest, I read the inner game of music. I wasn't crazy on it. Uh, I felt like... I felt like it wasn't as good, even though I'm a musician, if that makes sense, uh, which is kind of strange, but you may prefer it. So, you know, don't be afraid to try the inner game of music. For me, I'd rather get it from the source. Also, there are a number of great audiobooks of the source, and there are no audiobooks of the inner game of music that I know of. But if somebody's going to do one, I'll listen to it on the train. So anyway, listen, thank you so much for having me, guys. My name is Nick Jennison from Guitar Interactive. I want to take a quick second and shout out today's sponsor once again, uh, which is Orally Sound. Um, who have been kind enough to provide Songmaster Pro, which is the app that we've used for all of the demonstrations today. It's super cool. It's really powerful. Go click on the link. Go get it. It's great. It's worth your time. There's a free trial. You lose nothing, right? Go get it. It's really, really cool. It's good stuff. Um, so anyway, listen, thank you so much, guys. I want to take a quick second and say uh, from Racco Ivan says, do you do one-on-one -on -one online lessons? I do not, I'm afraid, uh, because there are not enough hours in the day. But this hint at one of the exciting developments that we've got coming for you. I can't say any more than that, but stay tuned. Stay tuned. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway, listen, thank you so much, guys. My name is Nick Jennings from Guitar Interactive. It's been a pleasure. We will see you guys next Monday. We're back on our usual Monday times. We're going to throw the Fusion track on at its usual tempo. I'm with the Noodle. This is Soundmaster Pro. Already sound being kind enough to sponsor today's stream. My name is Nick Jennings, and I will see you guys next week with another stream. Monday, 8 p.m. UK time. You know the drill. It says so down here. Smash the like and subscribe button if you haven't done so already. It helps us get these streams out to as many guitar players as we can. And I'll see you guys next week. Let's play. My name is Nick Jennison and it's a pleasure to introduce to you GI Plus, the brand new lesson platform brought to you by Guitar Interactive. We've assembled a team of the best players and educators in the world to bring you exclusive lessons covering everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length exclusive country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Or perhaps you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 60 feature-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmore.
Eddie Von Halen. Joan Petrucci. Larry Carlton. Slash. Tosin Abbasi. Paul Gilbert. And many more. You get all this along with exclusive live webinars, free backing tracks, competitions, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for GI Plus today.